Lions general manager Bob Quinn said Wednesday that he was disappointed former Oklahoma running back Joe Mixon was not invited to the NFL Combine because he would have liked for all of the teams to be able to evaluate him. Mixon was one of a handful of players not invited to the Combine after punching a woman in Norman, Oklahoma back in 2014. Here's Quinn. Um, yeah, we're going to leave the door open on Joe. I think it's really disappointing that Joe's not here. I think it's, um, you know, we come here to see the best college football players and for him not being here because of those issues, personally, I don't think that's real fair because we have a lot of investigation that we want to do on him and to get him in one spot for all the teams would have been great. But I think it is a disappointment that guys like him and there's a few others you can put in that category that, you know, we're going to be chasing around on the month of March and April. And it's really unfair to the players, to be honest with you. So, um, so the door's open, and I'd like to, you know, be able to get down, get a chance to sit down with uh, the people that know Joe or Joe and kind of see what, um, what the circumstances were around the incident. So Quinn looks at it as a disappointment and unfair to the players, also saying that Mixon is still on Detroit's draft board, but that it would be a long conversation before he felt comfortable about drafting the running back. Will Kane is back with us. Good to see you again. Stephen A., should Mixon have been invited to the Combine? Absolutely. And I think it was entirely hypocritical of the NFL not to have him there. Clearly, by not having him there, what you're trying to do is hurt his draft status. My point is, okay, I have no problem with that. Then why not just ban him from the league, from the league for a year? Why not just do that? If he's going to be allowed to be on an NFL roster, then why not give teams the opportunity to interview him, probe, talk to him, find out even more about what you're finding out about, and put him through the same intensive evaluation process that you would put anybody else through that has an opportunity eventually to play in an NFL uniform rather than prohibit that activity, thereby trying to hurt him by saying he's not invited here, he may not be somebody that you want, and trying to sully him in that fashion. I'm not trying to come to the defense of Joe Mixon in any way. What I'm simply saying is that make a call, make a decision. Are you going to allow him in the NFL or are you not? And if you are going to allow him to, into the NFL, which they're clearly going to do because he's going to be allowed to be drafted, then why don't you put him through the same scrutiny that you would subject anybody else to that has to show up at the NFL scouting combine? We all know the history of the combine. We know how invasive and probing that they can be. So the point is, if you've got executives saying, if this is somebody that we're allowed to consider bringing on board, why isn't he here to be evaluated like anybody else? That is in the interest of fairness. I don't think it's about being fair to Joe Mixon. I think it's more flagrant about being about the hypocrisy of the NFL who wants to come across as if they're making a decision when, in fact, they're really not. They're just coming across as flaming hypocrites. Make the call, bring him, allow him in, or don't. But don't dance around the issue like I believe they're doing. And there's, there's also a larger philosophical point here about American life. And, Will, you've discussed this in the past. What kind of behavior or, or should someone be permanently disqualified, in this case, not only for employment, but for consideration for employment? It doesn't make sense to me that if he is allowed to play, that he wouldn't be brought in to be physically evaluated like everyone else. Now, once you have that physical evaluation, that will go into the mix with the evaluation of other components of Mixon, including his behavior at that restaurant. And when that's all put together, teams may well decide to pass. But it doesn't make, along the lines of your reasoning, Stephen A., to me, a lot of sense to permanently prohibit someone from employment or even consideration for employment. And then if you decide not to do that, simply not evaluate them in a certain category. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Oh, I think you guys have set up a false choice. I don't think our choices are either permanent ban or full embrace or permanent ban or lack of full investigation. We can strike it down the middle here. And it's interesting, at the very least, to point out that we've had sort of a role reversal on some of our previous debates. Clearly, uh, based upon prior debates, you know, I think it would be entirely inappropriate to ban someone from the ability to earn employment at their special talents because of past indiscretions. I believe in second chances. I do think there's a threshold on that. I think when second turns into third and fourth and fifth and sixth, it expires at some point. But in the interest of nothing else, maybe, maybe simply morally, but even more reintegrating people into society, we want to give more chances. 
However, that doesn't mean we have to bend over backwards at every step to help them along the way. We don't have to accommodate. So in other words, you always hear the argument, you know, this is a privilege. Playing in the NFL is a privilege. X, Y, Z is a privilege. And some of that I take an issue with. I don't think employment is a privilege. I don't think pursuing your, your way as a productive member of society is a privilege. But I do think being invited to essentially what is a job fair is a privilege. Now, Stephen, now you point out, which I think is important, the combine is a chance for serious investigation. Let's find out if Joe Mixon is a worthy individual, worthy of investment. Well, I would say to you, no NFL team is precluded from that. If they're really interested in Joe Mixon, they can go on their own to his pro day. They can go sit down with him personally. And in fact, any team that's really willing to weigh the pluses and minuses of Joe Mixon should show that level of investment. They should go meet with him. I don't think they should in any way think they should be disappointed, as the Lions GM said, that he's not there and made it easy for them. The point in the end is this. We can strike a middle course. It can be nuanced. It doesn't have to be you're all the way in or you're all the way out. Yes, Joe Mixon should be able to be an NFL player, but he didn't have to be invited to every job fair on his way to that employment. Well, I, the way I disagree no, with No, but you, his, his well, physical talent. Go ahead, Steve. The way I disagree with you, Will, is this. That, by, by what we heard from Bob Quinn, the Lions general manager, you're essentially hurting the teams, per se, for the actions right. of a Joe Mixon. Because, yes, like you just said, they could step out and evaluate should. him. Should. But it would and take extra work. On, it, it would take, and they should, and it would take extra work on their part. What they're saying is, why should we have to go through this? What, what are you trying to do to him? You either want him in the league or you don't. And if you do want him in the league, any prospective draft pick will is invited to the NFL scouting combine. Why would well, you prohibit him from coming? That's the whole point. Mixon's it's, physical, it's, it's your Mixon's rules. physical abilities. It's what they do. It's not, it's not mixed. We're not asking for an exception here. It's what I, the NFL does. I would argue so why compromise Mixon's that? physical abilities, Mixon's physical abilities suggest he should be there. It is a, as you said, Will, a job fair. He is not being paid to be there. And in fact, it's an information gathering process. That, it doesn't make okay. a lot of sense to me why exclude him from that when that, though, that information you gather there, which really makes it easier for the teams, will be put in the mix okay. with other information, including his behavior in the restaurant, and, and, and teams may well pass after that. Well, first of all, any team that's unwilling, who finds it too hard to go visit Joe Mixon personally to invest in that level of investigation probably shouldn't be drafting him anyway. So I don't buy this whole thing about it's hurting it's the not team. The issue. I don't want a team that wants to casually run him through a combine interview to be the one that drafts him. If you want to take on Joe Mixon, show that you're willing to investigate fully what it is to draft Joe Wait, Mixon. But you want them to devote more resources? Yes. You think because of his bad behavior, teams should devote more He's a resources higher risk, to checking Max. him out? That's, is he not a higher risk? Why put the burden on the teams? Is he not a higher risk? Maybe, but why put the burden on the teams? Because they're the ones that are going to be employing them. If you take on a higher risk, show the willingness to invest further. You don't I know if you want point. to. If he doesn't I, work I, I, out, it I, may, I may not no, be no, worth it. I, dis I disagree with you, Will, but I totally understand what you're coming, where you're coming from. You're saying if you want Joe Mixon, we're going to make you work harder in order to probe him, investigate him, and ultimately acquire him. We're not going right. to make it easier. I'm saying leave it there, that's guys. still wrong for the NFL to do because it reeks of hypocrisy they have a rule yeah, on Steve their Yeah, Stephen, I have a lot of issues with the NFL on this one right. in terms of the inconsistency, right. but I will save that for tomorrow. Coming up next, a member of Jerry Judd's Ooh, own pick. family is saying he's not trustworthy. We'll tell you exactly what they said, plus... Colin Kaepernick was at the center of controversy last season as he decided not to stand up for the national anthem before games. What does he plan to do this season? We'll get into that next. And LeBron and Tristan Thompson and Kevin Love. I understand the Styles matchup argument, but we just saw the Warriors, as I mentioned yesterday, go across the country for the second of back-to-backs. They didn't have Kevin Durant for most of the game, and Steph Curry spent his second consecutive night ice cold. The Wizards, one of the top teams in the East, are playing at home and highly motivated, on a roll, and won by the skin of their teeth. And that's because the Golden State Warriors, like the Spurs, are extremely well coached. They're familiar with each other. 
They play as a machine. They have unselfish players. They can play the modern brand of basketball as well or better than anyone. And when you add Kevin Durant to the mix, and you, you Steph Curry, MVP, Kevin Durant, MVP, Klay Thompson, they have an offense, Stephen A., where a lot of the times the best option for the opposing defense is a wide open Clay Thompson, who might be the greatest shooter ever, or at least capable of, get, of getting hotter than anyone ever. That that oftentimes is the best option for the defense, and to mention nothing of Draymond Green and guys on the bench like Iguodala and Livingston and all that, and the championship pedigree. This one, I get why people would say talk about the Spurs, but they should not be hopeful that they that Durant comes back and plays for the Warriors if they believe that if, if, if the idea is yeah because we have a better chance against the Warriors with Durant than against the Spurs because they are wrong about that they have a much better chance against the Spurs than against the Warriors at full strength I'm not sure about that and I don't see how you can say that considering that experience matters savvy matters uh, tempo matters physicality matters all of those things come into play come playoff time uh, if you're just looking at it in a vacuum and you're looking at the level of talent that exists and you're dreaming about this epic matchup between the Cavs and the Warriors, it's understandable, Max. The issue in question, however, is this. We've been talking so much about the Golden State Warriors. Let me give you a reminder. Do you realize that the, the San Antonio Spurs are 46 and 13? Do you realize that the yeah, San Antonio Spurs are the, are the number one ranked defense in the National Basketball Association. When you combine that with the fact that I look at some of their, their shooting, in terms of three-point field goal percentage, they're number one. Number one. So they make threes, all right? They take great shots. They play great defense. And it's a collective effort. And more importantly, the tempo that they play at is not conducive to something that would be advantageous for the, you know, the Cleveland Cavaliers. LeBron other than James tempo, and how other than other than tempo, though, Stephen A. Everything you just said about the Spurs applies to Golden State, but with Durant, better players. Period. Like Tony well, Parker's good, even though he's older. He ain't close to Steph Curry. Uh, uh, as great as Kawhi Leonard is, Kevin Durant is better. Draymond, like, just think about the starting fives: Tony Parker, Danny Green, a very old Pau Gasol, still effective offensively, defensively not as much. LaMarcus Aldridge, you, you want to, to Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, Kevin Durant, and Draymond Green? It's just more talent on one side, much more. First of all, Max, a couple of things you got to consider. Understand that the San Antonio Spurs have 10 players averaging better than 17 minutes a game. 10. It's number one. Number two, when we talk about age, we're going to assume, because we make these prognostications and beyond, based on people being healthy on the court playing. Once you're healthy and you're on the court playing, it's no back-to-back. -back. You're getting about two days rest between games, okay, because you're healthy for each game. So I don't want to hear anything about age because at that particular juncture, when you're rested enough to perform, it comes down to your skill, not just physically, but mentally, schematically. All of those things factor into the equation. What I'm saying to you is that even though Golden State is elite as a defensive unit, they're elite when it comes to steals, their elite when it comes to their length and how they're able to defend perimeter play. But if you're Cleveland and you're hell-bent on going down low and imposing your physical Agreed. will against them, that is the weakness of the Golden State Warriors. It is not the weakness of the San Antonio Spurs. That's what by, I'm saying. By, by the way, just remember the playoffs the last couple of years. San Antonio looked like a well-oiled machine early and then a younger, more athletic team ran them out of the building a couple times. I mean, that's how they got bounced recently. I don't see fundamentally, at least in terms of their starting five, how it's going to be any different. You're right about that. But that's always against the Western Conference foe. Never in the finals has San Antonio got run out of the gym. Steve, I'm just so grateful right. that you're good optimistic about good these enough. matchups in the West and the NBA. This is a good thing. Ain't it special? Because a Ain't happy special Stephen Molly? A is a happy Molly Carroll. I, I gotta Carol, admit, I gotta admit, I'm, star I I'm starting to feel the NBA fever now, Max. I'm starting to feel the NBA fever. I'm starting to feel the NBA fever. We're turning around. We're feeling good about yeah. it. Yeah. On that note, gentlemen, let's leave it there because we need to talk about other things. Thank you, Steve. 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 Could he be the Aaron Rodgers to Tom Brady's Brett Favre? Plus, could the former bad...